Welcome to worship this morning. I'm glad those of you that are here are able to brave the cold and get in. Uh, it took me longer than I expected this morning. And I forgot to put a face mask on, cleaning off my car, so my face is like on fire. Uh, so I'm glad everyone is able to be here this morning. For those of you that are online, watching from home, glad you're able to join us this morning. Let's go ahead and enter, uh, enter into our worship service with a word of prayer. So if you would, let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you for bringing us to worship your glorious name this morning. Lord, as we enter into our weekly worship, Lord, with our church family, Lord, I pray that we would remember, Lord, your character and your goodness, your faithfulness to us. Lord, as we sing the truths of your word back to you and worship to you and encouragement to each other, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be Lord, brought into a submissive state so you can work in our lives through your spirit. Lord, I pray that as this is the first week, Lord, that we have Pastor Pete and his family back, I pray that the message that he has to bring to us Lord, would be encouraging, uplifting to our souls, and challenging Lord, to how we live our lives in the name of Christ. Lord, we ask that you would bless this service, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'd like to open up our service with reading Psalm 145, 2 and 3. It says this, Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Go ahead and join me in standing. Let's open up our service by singing, This is Our God.
Sunday singing this morning. If I can direct your attention to the screen, you'll see where we are with the budget as of the second week in the in the new year. Uh, doing doing well so far. <laughs> Keep it up. <laughs> uh, we praise God for His giving for the giving of His church this morning. Once again, you can go online, give.fpcmitch.org. You can give one time, or you can set up recurring gifts. All at your discretion. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord, we, we thank you for the faithfulness of your church. Lord, as we have begun this new year, uh, we, we, we want to, first of all, give you praise for your faithfulness to us, how you provide for us and care for us. Lord, we've had a few in our church family, Lord, who have experienced hardships this last year. And Lord, many in our church were able to surround them with love and care and make sure they were taken care of. And we want to give you all the glory for that. Lord, as we enter into this new year, Lord, I pray that you would lead us to be financially responsible stewards of what you've given to us. Lord, lead us in this. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Let's continue in our worship and song this morning by singing, Be Thou My Vision. scripture reading today, if I could direct your attention to the screen, you'll see the scripture. I'll read the first slide. If you would read the second with me, we'll continue in that fashion. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's continue with worship and song and sing together in Christ alone.
please take your seats. We're going to take a couple moments right now for some quiet and personal prayer and reflection before the message this morning. Heavenly Father, as we read in your word, we know, Lord, as our Heavenly Father, you are the one that supplies to Christ who it is that is to be saved. So we know that our salvation is in Christ alone. And we give you praise for this. We recognize that pre-Christ, we were in nothing but need of salvation from our own sin. Lord, after Christ, after receiving this immense, immeasurable blessing of Jesus, Lord, we recognize every day that as we wake, your richness and your goodness to us never fails and it continues. And as we grow our understanding of who you are, God, we begin to see more of your faithfulness, your immensity, your goodness to us. So Lord, I do pray that we would remember these things every day from the moment we wake up to the moment where our head hits the pillow, that we would remember your faithfulness to us, the desperation that we truly experience before Christ, and the restitution and the healing that we experienced after Jesus Christ. So Lord, let us remember these things. And Lord, as we enter into our final song and the message, prepare our hearts to this. And it's in Christ's name we pray and we ask these things. Amen. If you would, please join me in standing one last time. Let's sing together, His mercy is more.
take your seats. Good morning. Good morning. I will like to introduce myself. <laughs> uh, most of you know who I am, but um, Pastor Pete Jones, if you don't. <laughs> um, it's good to be here. I haven't, uh, I haven't preached in two months, which I was thinking about this the other day. That's the longest I've gone without preaching since high school. So um, buckle up. <laughs> but uh, take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 13. Psalm 13. Uh, children, you are dismissed. Sorry, I've been away. I forgot. Children, you are dismissed at this time. Psalm 13 is our text for this morning, and I'm going to read it for you, and then we'll get right into uh, the message. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Let up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Let's begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> God, we are thankful that we can be here. God, I'm thankful I can be here. Lord, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of it. I thank you for the comfort that it gives. I thank you for the instruction that it allows us to receive. Lord, I pray you'll help us as we go into your word that we will understand what you have for us. That you will guide me and that you will work through uh, this time together. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I want to start by saying that um, I have missed you all. I truly mean that. I'm thankful to be back here. Uh, it feels like ages since I stood behind this pulpit. God has done a lot in our lives as a family um, in the last two months. Um, God has worked in our lives. I want to thank so many of you that reached out to us in the last two months with encouraging words, whether it was just a text or a phone call or some of you even wrote letters. And I just, I appreciate it greatly. It meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to my wife. Uh, I appreciate those of you who just sent encouraging verses or told me you were praying for us. We know we felt your prayers. I know that through the last couple months, many of you have had questions about what has happened and what went on in our life. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm asking, and I know this is hard for some of you, but I'm asking that you still respect our decision to keep it to those who need to know. But I want you to know that God is at work. I debated about what to preach today. I thought about it for a while. Um, and uh, really, honestly, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I've been preparing this message for two months. Um, God has worked in my life. I decided that I didn't want to just jump back into Luke. I wanted to share with you uh, what God did in my life and in our family's life while I was on sabbatical. And when I first started thinking about it, I said, well, I'm going to take a week to do this. And then God laid something else in my heart. So I said, okay, I'll take two weeks to kind of take a break from Luke. And then God laid something else in my heart. So the next three weeks, I'm going to spend kind of looking at areas where God worked in our heart and my heart. Uh, and so I want to talk about that uh, with you today. One thing that I realized through this sabbatical, it reminded me of, is that life is hard. Let me ask you this question. I need some transparency with you. How many of you in the, in the course of your life have gone through a, a hard trial? Just raise your hand. Yeah, I would guess it's all of you. We've all gone through hard trials. Life is hard. Pain surrounds us all the time. 
As you know, those of you that are here, were here the last Sunday I was here, as you know, I was dealing with a lot of pain. I felt overwhelmed. I felt, I felt hurt. <coughs> but as I contemplated what was going on in my life at that time, as I, as I kind of uh, took some time to pray, as my wife and I spent a lot of time talking, we realized that the pain went deeper than uh, what's transpired in the last couple months. We realized that we were hurting. The last few years in my life, in our lives, has been, has been a whirlwind of various mental and physical and emotional and spiritual battles. And if I'm honest with you, I didn't even see it. But I was on the verge of a collapse. I hurt. And I, and I believe that we as Christians, are programmed to believe that we're so blessed by God that we must choose to be happy and upbeat all the time. We know that pain exists because we see it every day. We see it when we watch the news. We see it when we talk to our neighbors. We see it all the time. We know pain exists. We see it all the time. But I, I believe that our, our response often to pain is to, as Christians is to see it as a blessing. I, I, I thought about this many times as a pastor when I, when I talk to someone who's gone through a trial. We, we, we kind of say things sometimes, and, and I hope you see I'm, I'm, I'm opening my heart to you. We say things sometimes as, as Christians that I don't think we truly deeply mean in our hearts. You know, we go up to someone who's in a deep trial, and we say, how are you doing? And they go, oh, it's hard, but God's good. <laughs> Is God good? Yes. But sometimes it's still hard. And I think that there are three ways that we can respond to trials. I think the first one is many Christians respond to pain and trials with anger that leads to sin. Now, that anger can manifest itself in many different ways. Sometimes it's an anger that just sits inside and turns to bitterness. But sometimes that anger can grow to the point that a person becomes cynical or even resentful to God. We know that's sin. We understand that that's sin. We understand that's wrong. But I think the second response that many Christians use to deal with trials is to determine that they're not going to let it bother them. In other words, I think what many Christians do when they have a trial is they, they decide that they're going to gut it out, so to speak. That they're going to put on a good front, a good face. That they're going to put on uh, this, this idea that everything goes okay. And I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want you to hear me the wrong way. But sometimes that response can also be sin. Sometimes, here's the reality, life is more than we can bear. Hear me. Sometimes life is more than we can bear. Actually, I'll say this. It's often more than we can bear. This response of just stuffing it down and going on like life is okay, I'll, I'll be honest, is my normal response. It's, it's my normal go-to. Even when I dealt with all my, my health issues, I didn't allow myself to grieve for very long. I was in the hospital a couple times, and both times when I came out, I, I, I went back to work right away. And many times I was working in the hospital and, and went back to preaching as soon as I could. And, and, and just, I, I stuffed it down. I'm doing okay. I'm doing I'm great. But the reality was, is uh, I was wrong. And what happens is, and this is why I say this can be sin, is what happens is when we do that, oftentimes what it does is it leads to arrogance that I have fought my way through this trial. 
Now, what I want to do to, to the, now is give you the third response. And this third response is the thrust of my message. The third response, I think, is one that many of us want to avoid, but I believe it's exactly what God expects, and I even think it's what God desires. <clears throat> so you see it on the screen there. I want to talk to you about the prayer of lament. I want to talk to you about what it means to lament. We need to learn how to lament. I know what some of you are probably thinking, doesn't the Bible say to rejoice always? It does. But the Bible is also filled from cover to cover with lament. I once had someone tell me, they said, as Christians, we're supposed to have joy in the Lord, and so we should never lament. I don't think that's biblical. So I want to give you just quickly a couple reasons why I believe that not only does God, uh, is God okay with your lament, but I think God wants you to lament. The first reason that God wants us to lament is because sin still reigns in this world. Sin still is a part of this world. Jesus' death on the cross defeated sin and death, but that completion is a future reality. Jesus' work on the cross is complete, but the results of his work are not. So therefore, sin still exists. And sin brings nasty results. Nasty ones. And sometimes the nasty results of sin are because of our own sin in our own life. But sometimes the nasty results of sin in our life have nothing to do with anything we've done. And so we need to lament and mourn not only our sin, but the sin of the world. I mean, look out and look, it doesn't, it doesn't take much to see. You just look and see what's going on and, and you see uh, this war and this battle and this political fight and you see uh, this trial and you see this and, you, and it's like, man, there's, there's pain in this world. And it's okay to lament. The second reason why lament is okay because men and women throughout scripture lamented and here's the thing, God wants us to know about it. That's why he put it in his word. It is estimated that over 50 of the Psalms, it's a third of the Psalms, are laments. There's this book of the Bible called Lamentations. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet, and he wrote in the book of Jeremiah, which was pages after pages after pages of his lament over the sin of God's people. Job is about the deep lamenting of a man who's facing trials that he didn't even know why he was facing. And here's the, here's the crazy part about the book of Job. As you read the book of Job, nowhere in the entire book of Job does Job find out that his trials had nothing to do with his sin. You see that? Like it doesn't say, God does at the end, doesn't say, hey Job, by the way, you went through all these trials and it wasn't because you sinned. God never gave him that. And yet he faced these trials and he lamented about it. Most of the Old Testament prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets, at some point in those prophets, they, they, they lament before God. Go to the New Testament. I've had people say, well, lamenting was Old Testament thing. No, go to the New Testament. You'll see numerous laments in the New Testament. We're going to look at one later in Romans chapter 8 uh, and talk about that. But uh, let's not even forget the times Jesus lamented. How many times did that happen? The greatest of these is when Jesus is on the cross and he quotes from Psalms and he, and he says this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a prayer of lament. <clears throat> I hope that I have convinced you that lamenting is not only okay, but it's what God wants. Now this whole time, some of you might be thinking, Okay, Pastor Pete, what actually is a lament? I mean, I hear you say that, but what does that mean? So I'm going to give you a definition, and then I'll kind of build this definition as we go along. Here's a definition of lament on the screen there. It's an honest cry of a hurting heart wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promise of God's goodness. 
Let me read that again. It's an honest cry. And we'll get into an honest cry of a hurting heart, a, a broken heart, a crushed heart, wrestling with the paradox of pain and the promises of God's goodness. When I left for the sabbatical, I was, I was a, a hurting heart. And I'll be honest with you, there's still hurt. But I was a, a hurting heart, and, and I, I decided that part of my sabbatical, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do it is I wanted to take a lot of time and read. And so I began uh, kind of searching what are some books I could read. And actually, Pastor Will recommended a book, and uh, I was going to bring it up here with me, and I forgot. Uh, it's a book on lamenting. It's called uh, Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. It's an excellent book. If you uh, are going through a, a time of trials, it's a good book to read. Uh, Pastor Will recommended it. I bought it, and then I went home and told my wife. I said, I bought this book. She said, we already own it. I was like, okay. <laughs> so we both read it, which worked out well. At the same time, I'm, I'm reading through uh, a chronological Bible, and in the chronological Bible, I had started it um, uh, back in October. In the chronological Bible, the way it uh, worked for this particular Bible, as soon as I started reading this book on lament, I entered the book of Job in my reading. It was providential, wasn't it? And as I walked through these two things together, God began laying on my heart this sermon that I'm about to preach to you. You say, you've already been preaching for a while. I know. This was all introduction. I'm sorry. Uh, the basics of this outline actually come from the book that I read, but the rest of it's all mine. Before we begin, though, I want to ask you to think about hardships in your own life. What are you going through? I'm not going to describe any right now. I'm actually going to do that later. But I want you to think about it. And how are you dealing with those hardships? Are you, are you angry with God about it? Or maybe you're just stuffing it inside. Maybe what God wants you to do is lament. So let's talk about that through this psalm, Psalm 13. We see uh, four aspects that we're going to see with David. First of all is keep turning to God in prayer. The first thing that I see that David is doing is he's turning to God in prayer. And we're going to look at the first two uh, points in this message. are going to look very similar, and, and they have different emphases. In this one, what I want you to emphasize, I want you to notice, is who is David praying to in this lament? And you'll notice that at the very beginning of uh, the first verse, he says, How long, O Lord? Notice that David is addressing his pain to God. He's bringing his struggles, his, his questions, his tough questions to God. He doesn't run from God even though it's painful. I sometimes think that we as Christians, we hesitate to bring our pain to God. We, 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 we get disappointed because we've, we've prayed to God to answer certain things and God hasn't responded the way that we thought he should. And so uh, things get out of control. This seems frustrating. And so then we just, we just hesitate to bring it back to God. Early on in our sabbatical, we were having an exceptionally hard week. In the midst of that hard week, our kitchen sink backed up, which it's backed up again, but that's a whole other subject. It backed up. I'll be honest, it was a time my wife and I, we were both struggling, we were emotional, and my wife looked at me, uh, when the kitchen sink backed up, she looked at me and she said this, she said, uh, when will it stop? Is a backed up kitchen sink the end of the world? No. But sometimes a kitchen sink can cause us to say to God, God, enough. But if we do not take it to God, even the small things, if we don't take it to God, then we end up in a spiritual desert unable to speak to him. And David's in a, in a horrible place. The Bible doesn't tell us what's taking place in David's life. We don't know. There are many trials David went through, and, th and this could be one of many different ones, or it could be one we don't even know about. But David's in the middle of this trial, and he laments by taking it to God. A lament, again, is bringing our honest, humble, pain-filled questions to the feet of God. I want you to know the second point here. 
And you can say, this is going to sound familiar, bring your complaints to God. The last one, I wanted to emphasize who we're taking to is God. But this one, I want to emphasize the beginning part of this point, And that is, bring your complaints. I'm sure when I say that, it causes some of you some angst. There's a tension that is created with that sentence. I mean, a complaint is a bad thing, isn't it? Okay, how many of you as parents, raise of hands, how many of you as parents have told your kids not to complain? Okay, it's a common thing. Stop complaining. Stop complaining. Okay, my kids are older now, um, they're, uh, and they still will say, stop complaining. We think complaining is a bad thing. It's wrong, right? That's, that's, that's not what we should do. But, but complaints can't always be wrong because we see it over and over and over again in the Bible, and God's okay with it. God doesn't tell them to stop. Especially in the Psalms, and here's an example of this in Psalm 13, where David is bringing his complaint to God, and we don't see God rebuke him for it. I am not suggesting that God is okay with us with us bringing our selfishness and our anger to him. But I am suggesting that God is not only okay with it, but he desires it. He desires for us to bring our complaints to him. And that's important. So what I want to do is I want to look at David's complaints. Look at these verses again. And what we're going to see in, this, in this, these first two verses is that David is using these questions to lament. And what, what he is lamenting uh, specifically is kind of his felt absence of God. And what you're going to notice in his felt absence with, from God is that the intensity grows with each question. It, it seems like it's building more and more. And, it's, and I, I've envisioned this. I envision that David is talking to God and, he's, and he starts with the first question and, and he feels like he's not getting an answer. And so he magnifies the question anymore, so, uh, even more. So let's look at it. The first question he says is what? Look at the beginning of verse 1. How long, O Lord? That's simply David saying, God, I, I don't like this. Have you ever been in a trial and you're like, God, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like it. That's what David's doing. He's saying, God, I wish things were different. I don't want to be where I'm at. How much longer is this going to last? Maybe the trial you're going through right now, that's what you're thinking. God, I don't like it. That's an honest question. And we're asking that question, and that's okay. I felt that, and I'm sure that some of you have at some point felt, God, how long? Each of us maybe has a different end to that question. Each of us, the, the length of time might be different, but still, we can, we can understand that question. But then David goes on from there. Look what he says next in verse 1. He says, how long, O Lord? Then look what he says. Will you forget me forever? And here, in one step, he goes from perhaps maybe an inconvenience, a situation, to now he's admitting that he feels like God has forgotten him. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. David knew, and if you've spent time studying Scripture, then you know, theologically, that God can't forget anything because he's God. He knows everything. He knows every, everyone. There's nothing that falls out of God's mind. But man, in this moment, David feels like for sure God has forgotten him. So he says it to him. He goes from, God, I don't like this, to I'm forgotten. And then notice his third question. At the end of verse 1, he says, how long will you hide your face from me? I think this is an even higher level of intensity because before in the first two questions, it's David's issue that he doesn't like where he's at. And, and it's, it's maybe he's thinking, God, I'm the one that's forgettable. Maybe it's my fault. But this third question, David now turns it on God and he says, God, how long will you hide your face from me? God, how long are you going to stay away? I mean, think about that. Is that what God is doing here? Is he staying away? Is God hiding his face? I mean, that's how David feels. 
His reality is that God has actively chosen to hide his face. David feels that he can't see God's face. He feels like he can't see uh, God's purpose in what's happening. For David, if he's honest about where he's at, he feels like he's trying to talk to God and all he's getting is a busy signal. God's not answering. This is an experience that I think if, if each of us are honest, probably majority of the people in this room have experienced this. And this is the, the experience of the uh, felt absence of God. And it's real. It's a dark night of the soul. It's, it's the moment when you realize that it's, it's not too hard to imagine that God has nothing to do with you. Look at verse 2. He continues on. He says, How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemies be exalted over you? Here in this, this next verse, he goes from the sense of absence to now reckoning with his isolation. He's saying, uh, How long do I take counsel in my soul? In other words, David is having to ask himself for advice because in his mind, God's not listening. He's talking to himself and he's sorting things through things on his own because he feels all alone. And then in verse 2, there's a, the last question, which is an interesting one. And I, I think this last question, if I can try to understand David's mind, I think this last question is kind of a transition. He's now starting to, to see things differently, and we'll get into that in a minute. But he, he asks a question. He says, how long shall my enemies be exalted over me? The enemies of David are exploiting his situation. And David's felt reality is that God is checked out and involved, and that counts as a point for the bad guys. So he says to God, God, me not feeling your presence means that the enemy has won. And so, the first thing is we need to take it to God. The second thing is we need to bring our complaints, specifically our complaints, to God. Thirdly, we need to ask God boldly. We need to ask God boldly. In verses 1 and 2, David is honest about the absence of God that he feels. And then in verse 3, he pleads with God to intervene. Look at verse 3. He says, consider, and he's speaking to God, the creator of the universe in this. Think about that. He's saying, consider and answer me. You see the desperation there? I mean, he's sitting there and he's saying, how long, how long, how long, how long is this going to happen? Then he comes and he says, now, God, answer me. But he doesn't do it in a disrespectful way because he says, oh, Lord, my God, my master, my king. And then look at, look at what he wants the answer of. Look what he says in the middle of verse 3. He says, light up my eyes. That's an interesting phrase. The ESV here gives us a very, it's a super literal translation. The, the Hebrew word there, light up, it's, it's a way we might say, enlighten my eyes. In other words, David is understanding that he needs God's help to see rightly. He's saying, God, he's coming to God saying, God, how long, how long, how long? And then he comes to God and he says, God, please answer me. Light up my eyes. In other words, allow me to see in a right way, which means I think that David had enough presence of mind to know that he wasn't currently seeing God in a right way. And this is a really important step in this psalm because it actually clarifies how we understand verses 1 and 2. David is admitting that what he's doing now, the way he is praying, the lament that he was bringing to God is because he has the inability to see what God is doing. I, I love the way Charles Spurgeon puts this about this passage. Uh, look, look what he says. He says, let the eyes of my faith be clear so that I may see God in the dark. See, I love that because for David, he's still in the dark. 
You know, sometimes I think as Christians, we do this like we pray to God and we pray to God and, and we, we stay in the doldrums and like, ah, where's God? Where's God? Until he answers the prayer. And David here is in the midst of the pain and the agony. And, and yet he's, he, he still is saying, God, I want to see you even though it's dark. I want to be able to see you. The question of how long in verse 1 still stands. But that doesn't mean that God isn't there. He says, God, how long? How are you going to forget me? How long are you going to hide your face from me? But there he comes and he says, I want to be able to see you're there. There's an irony going on here if we think about it. David is talking to God who he feels isn't there at all. David starts with, God, where are you? But he continues talking like he knows where God is. Why? Because his, his, his understanding of God, his knowledge of God is taking over. Remember, remember the definition of lament? It's a hurting heart uh, asking God to work through the paradox of pain and the promises of God. He's, he's in pain, but he's saying, God, your promise is that you're always there. But I don't feel it. This is where David goes beyond his feelings, and he starts putting his will to work. God, it feels like you're absent, but I know you're not. Help me. Make me see. Give me perspective. Let light up my eyes. And then he does, and I'm not going to dwell on this very much, but then he, 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 he tells God, it's interesting, he tells God. He tells God that there are some uh, negative, bad outcomes that are possible if God doesn't light up his eyes. And we'll just go through those quickly. You see in verse uh, four or three and four, he says, light up my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. And, and that's talking about a spiritual death there. And he says in verse four, lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. The boldness here of David is clear. He begs God to answer and he reminds him why it is necessary. It is not that we need to educate God about consequences. It's not that David need to educate God about consequences. But by doing this, what David was acknowledging, and when we do this, we acknowledge something as well. And that's in our hearts and minds that we truly need God. He's saying, God, light up my, my eyes so that I can see, because if you don't, all of this is going to happen. In other words, David's saying this, I can't just work myself out of this. I need you. I need you. But then fourthly, I want you to notice the last step I think David takes. And that's choosing to trust God. This is a beautiful one. Look at verse 5. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. I have trusted in your steadfast love. There's so many places in the Bible where we have these, we have verses and then, and then we'll see a, the little conjunction but and it changes the whole process. I think of Ephesians where Paul is talking about uh, our sin and how we're dead in our sin and, and then he says, but, but God is rich in mercy. This is one where it's, it's, it seems negative and everything is bad. And David's saying, I'm, I don't feel your presence, God. You've got to light things up. Otherwise, otherwise all these bad things are going to happen. And, and, and then he comes and he says, but regardless, I have trusted. See, a lament, uh, some might say, is a lament the same as sorrow and mourning? And I don't believe it is. And here's why. We can mourn over losses, and it becomes introspective. But a lament is saying, God, I, I feel the pain, I feel the hurt, but despite that, I'm going to still trust in you, because you are good. And David tells us three statements con confirming his trust in this passage. First of all, he says uh, that he trusts in, in God's faithful love. It says in the passage there in verse 5, but I trusted in your... Uh, and notice he says, I have trusted, by the way, not I will trust. 
I have trusted in your steadfast love. What is the idea of steadfast love? The idea of steadfast love is love that has been proven to David in the past over and over and over again. David trusted in what he's seen in the past. The statement that David made at the beginning of verse 5 is a statement of trust that anticipates a praise not yet seen. In other words, David is saying uh, to God that he does not know how or when or, or if God will answer his prayer, but he knows God will at some point rescue him from the pain. Secondly, <clears throat> he rejoices in God's gracious salvation. He rejoices. Look again at verse um, 6. He says, I will, excuse me, verse 5, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. That, next, that statement there tells us that trusting in God is not enough. It must lead us then to rejoice in him as well. We rejoice not because we've escaped the trial. We rejoice because, because in trust we know God's purpose for salvation is there despite the trial. It is leaning on what God has done and it's learning of what God says he will do and then rejoicing even when the promise hasn't been fulfilled. Let me show you what I mean. I said earlier there about a New Testament lament. You can turn there if you want, but I have it on the screen. You go to uh, Romans chapter 8, and in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, there is probably one of the favorite verses of every Christian on this earth, okay? It says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That's a lovely, beautiful promise. That all things work together for good. Now, sometimes I think we, we hang on to that promise, like hey, we're going through a trial, and all things work together for good, and we hold on to it waiting for the good, right? Sometimes the good isn't what we think is, is the good. <laughs> but here we see this passage where, where Paul is speaking, and he's, he's saying, hey, if you love God, all things will work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. But then we go down in this passage and we find uh, another part there where, where Paul continues and he says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And uh, he'll answer that in a little bit. But he, he begins to talk about trials and look what he says here. And he's speaking to Christians and he's saying, so tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. He's saying, are these things going to separate us from the love of Christ? Well, I want to stop there for a moment because what I want to tell you is this. What Paul is saying is, is we as Christians will experience these things. He is not saying these things will not happen. He's saying this, in the midst of these things, will you be separated from the love of Christ? This is, this is Paul's form of lament. He's saying, hey, this this is hard stuff. He goes on, and the next thing you see there, it says, as is written, he quotes here from Psalms, uh, actually another beautiful psalm of lament. You want to take time to read that one. And he says there, for your sake, for God's sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. I, there's a lot we could break down with that verse, but we're not going to because of time. What he's saying, he's saying, we're going to go through trials. And we're going to feel pain. But look how he continues this. This is where he answers the question. He says, will, will any of those things, will any of our pain or agonies or hurts or trials separate us from the love of God? He says, no. In all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then, if that wasn't enough, he expanded on that. He says this, for I am sure, uh, actually, I like the King James better here. He says, I am persuaded, I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor death, nor anything in all of creation, nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
But I'll be honest, sometimes we, uh, if we go back, sometimes in the midst of, of tri tribulation and distress and persecution and famine and nakedness and danger and sword, we don't see this, the love of God. And that's the idea of a lament. God, I'm in this trial and I don't see the end. But you're good. And I trust in you. Let's look at the third affirmation of David's trust. He says, thirdly, sing of God's bountiful care. In verse 6, he says, I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. He has dealt bountifully with me. David's complaints and requests have now reached the intended end. And here's the thing is the intended end is not rescue from the trial. We don't see that. The intended end is a faith-filled worship. It's a faith-filled worship. This is a common theme throughout the 50 Psalms of Lament. This is something that we see David do over and over again. And I want to give you another example of that real quickly here. In Psalm 28, at the beginning of Psalm 28, David says, To you, O Lord, I will call my rock. Be not deaf to me. It's kind of the same idea. He's saying, are you hearing me? Lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. He says, I, 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 feel, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm going to fall into a pit. But look what he said just a few verses later in verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with song I give thanks to him. We need to learn to come out of those laments not with the problem solved all the time, but with praise. It is not the, that the problems are gone, but we become so convinced of God's power and of God's presence that we trust in him. It is believing that God is enough to answer the prayer even when he hasn't. I want to read to you a quote Another book that I read over, uh, over my sabbatical is a book by A.W. Tozer called The Attributes of God. And in it, he's talking about God's immensity, uh, about God's presence. And I found this uh, incredibly encouraging. Look what A.W. Tozer says about God. He says, God has the attribute of, uh, of immensity, which means you don't have to go distances to find God. He is in everything. He is right here. God is above all things, beneath all things, outside of all things, and inside of all things. He is beneath but not pressed down. He's outside but not excluded. He's inside but not confined. This is the immensity of God. God, this is a beautiful thought. God does not travel anywhere. We might pray, God, come and help me, but actually God doesn't have to come to help us because God, there isn't a place anywhere where God is not. Whatever trial you're in, God's there. So what does this mean to us in closing? What heavy trial or agony are you experiencing? Over the last couple months, as we've been, <clears throat> as we've been going through the trial, but kept coming back to me was the trials that many of you are experiencing. And I hurt for you. I could stand up here today and point at so many of you and say, I, I know the trial you're going through. Some of you are experiencing health issues some of you are experiencing trials at your job. Some of you have conflicts in relationships. Your marriage is not what you want it to be. Your relationship with your kids isn't good. Your relationship with your parents isn't good. 
I know there are numerous people in our church, whether you're here or you're watching online, I know there are numerous people in our church that absolutely ache because they have a child, an adult child, who has, has wandered from God. Some of you are experiencing financial trials. Some of you are parenting, and it's hard. Some of you are, are dealing with many other issues that maybe I don't even know about. And here's what I want to tell you, and here's the thrust of my message today. God is okay with you bringing your complaints to him in trust. I want to do something a little different today. I've borne out my soul to you, so I want, I want, I want you to be honest here. So what I want to do is I want to ask everyone at this time to stand, please. Everyone stand. And here's what I want you to do. I, I, heads bowed, eyes closed. I don't need you to look around right now. In a moment, we will. But I know there are many in here who are going through a trial. You're hurting for one reason or another. Maybe it's your own doing, maybe it's not. But you're feeling pain. This is what I'd like to do. If you're here today and you're facing a deep trial, you're going through a deep pain, I want you to know, first of all, that you can, that you can take it to God. And I want you to know you're not alone. So if you're here and you're going through a deep trial, here's what I ask you to do. I want you to just right now, where you're at, take a seat and pray. Wherever you are, if you're going through a trial, you're going through an agony. Maybe it's been a trial for the last 50 years. I don't know. Whatever it is, you're going through a deep pain. You're hurting. You're, you're calling to God and you're saying, God, why? How long? Be honest about it and have a seat and say, God, I want to pour out my heart before you. You're not alone. I'm going to give you a few minutes just to pray. But if you are going through a trial, take it to God. Take it to God. Now, here's what I want to ask. Those of you that are seated, stay seated. One of the things that is, has hit me immensely is the love of God's people. By the way, I'll be preaching on that in two weeks. But the love of God's people. And so here's what I want to have happen. If you are seated right now, stay seated. If you are standing, I want you to look around and I want you to find someone seated and I want you to go and pray with them. You don't have to know what their trial is. In fact, it's okay that you don't know what their trial is. If they want to share, fine. But if you are seated and stay there, if you see someone that's seated, you go find them and you pray with them. Look around. Come on, this is where the church has to come. The Bible tells us that our responsibility as a church is to bear one another's burdens. So find someone with a burden. Go. Do it now. Find someone with a burden. If there's three or four people around, fine. Find them. Get around them. Hold on to them. Pray with them. I'm going to give you some time to pray together. Go ahead and do it.
God, we are thankful that you are a God who is willing to hear our complaints. Lord, if we come to you humbly, you will hear us. And you're not upset by it. You actually want us to. God, I pray that for those here that are hurting, Lord, I know there are people here that are hurting, and I pray that you will, you will surround them, allow them to have their eyes light up enough that they can see you. Lord, I know there are probably people hurting that aren't here today. I pray that you will work in their heart. Lord, I know there are probably people here that are here today that didn't, didn't want to let anyone know. I pray that you work in their heart as well. Open their eyes. Lord, we are thankful for all that you do for us. We're thankful for the healing of God's word. We're thankful for healing even when there's not uh, an end to the problem. And Lord, I pray that you will work. We ask that God is glorified through our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as we talked about, we can rejoice in that. And so we're going to do that through singing, Pastor Will. If you would, please join me in standing. A closing song is very fitting and appropriate for us right now. Just as I am without one plea. When we get to the chorus of this song, if you have found yourself in the middle of a trial right now or have in the past, you will understand these words where it says, I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, desperate to be rescued, and empty to be filled. That is only accomplished through the gospel of Christ. We are so thankful for that. So let's be centered on this as we close out our service, just as I am.
Father, we praise your name for bringing us to worship you together as First Baptist this morning. We're grateful for this time of fellowship, our time of shared purpose together around the unity of the gospel of Christ. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in us, Lord, that the need of during these times when we are facing trials, when in front of us is hardship. I pray, Lord, that we would not ignore but the blessing of what is lamenting what i pray and i think of those lord who specifically are going through trials and struggles and hardships right now but i know we prayed for them but i pray that we would continue to count these people what is more significant than ourselves and to care for them and reach out to them but as more people enter into trials i pray that you would keep or the eyes of our mind and heart open to see the struggles I pray that you would keep us humble enough to reach out when we are in the trial, Lord, to seek prayer and encouragement in the word. I pray, Lord, that we would be a, a, a local body of Christ defined by the likeness of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, build this mind into us. Use your spirit to guide us in this, and we'll give you praise and glory for it. That's the name of Christ we believe and pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to have a brief announcement video, and then after that, you will all be dismissed for this morning. Hey, First Baptist family, glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, we are thankful that you prioritized this gathering of the church body. I hope you were edified and encouraged. Now. Let me fill you in on a couple things that will be important for you to know. First of all, if you are a part of the Sow and Reap ministry here at First Baptist, Tuesday evening, 6 p.m., you guys will be meeting here in the church building. Also, the 22nd of January is when the Young Adult Bible Study is going to be starting back up. Uh, we took a little bit of a break for the Christmas season, plus with everything else going on, Pastor Pete going on sabbatical, something about my wife and I having a kid, we needed a break. But we're starting back up January 22nd. So... If you are an adult between the ages of 18 and 25, you are welcome to join. We meet on Monday evenings in my office right here. So if you're interested in being a part of that or you know someone that might be interested in being a part of that, go ahead and make sure to find me after the service. I'll tell you everything you need to know. I'm looking forward to it. If this is your first time here joining us at First Baptist, we are thankful that you chose to worship with us. Go ahead and stop by our guest center in the annex and you'll find a gift mug set out just for you. First Baptist family, I hope you have a blessed week. <laughs>